announcements. But first, let's say a, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege it is to be called your people, as unworthy as we are, Lord God. I thank you so much for the righteousness that you've given us in your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life on our behalf, Lord God, who was perfectly obedient in our place. God, I praise you and thank you so much that we can gather here today to have our hearts and minds elevated to think about you and your great truth. Lord, I thank you so much for your kingdom coming and your will be done. I pray, God, that that will be the case today in our hearts and minds. In your name, amen. All right, so first announcement is the Glen Alpine Backpacks. Don't forget, we're still uh, challenging our church to bring in food for the Glen Alpine Backpacks uh, the last Sunday of every month, and we send about uh, 25 backpacks of food every week to go home with a child. Again, thank you so much for your help in the ministry. Next is a church game night. That will be Sunday, March 4th at 6 p.m. Uh, bring some snacks and your favorite board game. I have a recommendation, the worst case scenario survival game. Any of you own that game? Totally awesome. It's like multiple choice and you figure out how to like take a punch to the face or run away from killer bees. Perfect game. Um, next is the Mommy and Me paint party. That will be Saturday, March 10th at 5 p.m. And the Children's Ministry will be hosting a paint party for moms and dads. Uh, and their children in the fellowship hall. You can see uh, Matt Rogers who's sitting over here in the front uh, for more information about that. Uh, lastly, the uh, missions dinner. Uh, the second missions dinner is scheduled uh, for Sunday, March 18th. After the morning worship gathering, uh, we'll be serving soup and sandwiches. Uh, Robbie Smith uh, from the Catawba River Association will be joining us to explain a little bit about how our giving is helping uh, missionaries take the gospel all over the world. Um, next, I believe uh, Melissa Taylor is going to come up and uh, speak a little bit. Where? Ever she? Oh, excellent. Um, so I'm Melissa Taylor, and um, for the past um, three trips, I have had the pleasure of being the coordinator for a medical mission trip to Kenya. And um, the next trip will be coming up in April. Um, I'll be coordinating a team to be going to Kenya on April 5th. And um, we've had the pleasure before to have people from our church to be part of this trip. And I think that's kind of a big deal because um, a church this small to be part of sending a medical mission team or being part of a medical mission team going to Kenya, um, like I said, I think it's a pretty big deal. So I wanted to share a little bit about the medical mission team trip and give you guys some more information because I think it's important that the church be um, on board with that and that we be more integrated with this trip. So um, I wanted to give you guys kind of an idea of what we do and what we're about. This upcoming trip, we're going to have three providers. These providers are going to be three nurse practitioners. We're going to have three nurses, and we're going to have uh, one um, what I call ancillary person. He's actually the husband of one of the providers. He's been with us on the past two trips and he kind of serves as a little bit of um, a do-it-all person for um, help where we need it. And we actually are hooked up with the Sawyers who our church supports in medical missions in Kenya. And for those of you who follow their website, they are um, have now incorporated to be straight up missions. And again, this is um, who our church supports in the bush of Kenya. And our medical mission group now has an official name. We have partnered with them to be straight up medical in Kenya. And where we go, this is kind of a hard concept for people to say. When you say the Bishop of Kenya, um, sometimes that doesn't mean a lot to people. But we travel into Nairobi, and then we travel six hours out of Nairobi. Um, we are actually what they consider the Maasai Mara, and we are in the official bush. Um, sometimes the best way I know how to explain where we're at, if anybody's seen on National Geographic the big cat diaries that used to come on, that is exactly where we are, is where they film the big cat diaries. Um, so it's a pretty cool place to be. Um, there are little villages set up, um, and I'm going to share some pictures with you here in just a few minutes to give you an idea of um, how people live. And 
an idea of exactly what we're doing there. But what we do is we set up medical clinic from the ground up. There's very limited medical care there. So when we go, we take supplies and we set up a medical clinic just like we were setting up a medical clinic here in our church. Everything that we do, we take with us, we set it up from scratch, and we start with nothing. So um, we have set up in the church. We did that the first couple of years, and then um, last time we went, we had um, some new experiences where we started loading up medicines and literally taking them on four-wheelers and going out into the villages and setting up clinics on site in the villages um, was a really unique experience and one that was very fruitful and we're going to keep doing that. And so you start to build trust with these people. They get to know you and it's been a really, really neat experience. One of the highlights of my last trip was riding into, I was on the back of the truck, and riding into the village, and someone actually calling me by name as we were riding into the village. It was one of the coolest experiences of my life to think, wow, they actually know my name. Um, but you build trust with these people. Um, they say we are the good doctors, the people with good medicine, but this also comes with cost. So every time that we have set up clinic, um, the way we try to estimate the cost of our clinic, we go back, we keep great records of how many patients we've seen, we keep records of the medicine that we've used, and so every year our numbers have grown exponentially. Um, we think probably in part because people trust us, word gets out that we're there and we're traveling more, but we're seeing more people. So we have grown to see more than roughly about 100 to 150 people a day. And the cost of medicine um, this year has actually grown as well. So our budget has grown exponentially also. Um, we're going to be on site there for 10 days. We're going to be setting up clinic for probably seven of those days. So our budget went through the roof this year. Um, and I want all of you to know that every person that goes, not a penny of the money taken in is going to pay for anybody's expenses. Every person that goes pays for all of their expenses on their own. Every dime that's taken in goes solely to pay for medications for these clinics and medications only. Also, every provider, we now have to have a license through the Kenyan government, so we are paying for those licenses completely on our own as well. And these are not cheap, so we are all paying for this out of pocket. Um, so this just kind of gives you an idea of how invested we are in this. Um, but probably a good thing to do is show you some pictures and give you an idea of um, what we do. So, of course, this is just one of the cuties that, that we've served, but I'm going to go through some of the pictures and just share a little bit with you. So, we treat um, a lot of the same ailments. This just gives you an idea. This is typical. Um, as you can imagine, we treat a lot of arthritis, and here's your reason why right here. Everybody complains of back pain, joint pain. Um, the women do it all, but here's your reason. That's kind of self-explanatory right there. You can go on. And we were, this was a very interesting visit for us. We were in a town, and <clears throat> this memory will always stand out to me because we had to leave this site. Um, you can't travel after dark. It's not safe. We were on four-wheelers um, because of the animals, and um, it's just not safe to travel after dark. So we were swarmed with people wanting to see us. And you'll see Todd Huntsman in the picture there. He's one of the providers. And we left this site 
in tears this day because we had to turn probably 100 people away. We could not see them for two reasons, because of time constraints, and we ran out of medicine. So um, we left there in tears that day, um, and this place was far enough away that we weren't able to go back. Um, so you can go on. This is a typical, well actually I say this is not a typical home. Um, this was after a storm, but you'll see the women, they build all the homes. This is actually a really, really large home for a community there, um, but this is what they live in and the women build everything. So this is a really, really large home by their standards. But this is what you'll see, and the women do all the repairs, the women do all the work. Um, so this is typical. And this was when we were at a site, and this is Laura Sawyer, and she was um, sharing actually a Bible story with a crowd, and you can see how into it they were, and note the one child in the middle with no clothes on, and you'll find that that's very typical too that most of them, all they have is what they have on their back, and some of them don't even have that. Um, this is, I think this is neat because this is how they carry their babies. Um, they just wrap them in, this is typical dress, and um, they're wrapped like this. But despite it may be 90 degrees outside, um, I always find it interesting that layer after layer after layer after layer, so, and they're still cold, so. Um, we were about to drip with sweat, and they're still, I'm cold, I'm cold. Um, so, we always find that entertaining, too. Um, they are getting better at hygiene, however, there is still, just like you would find here, a discrepancy between everybody's poor. But there's poor and there's really poor. And so you'll see the ones that are on the really poor side and they have really poor hygiene and they are always covered in flies. And so you'll see the little children like this who, and this is because that um, the dung it is in their huts and it's not cleaned off of them and you will see the children constantly covered in the flies like this. And they love to have their pictures taken. If you can take a picture and show it to them, it just makes their day and they, um, I mean, you see everything from um, typical complaints are always joint pain, Everybody has diarrhea because of the poor water, and um, they lots of malaria, lots of typhoid because of the area. But one thing that will be really hard to take sometimes is all the kids suffer from abuse, but that is very common in their culture. And this is just a picture of when we were we were mobile, as I say. We were out in the middle of a village working off the backs of the four-wheelers. And just more, they just will swarm you to be seen. And we had to have come up with some kind of order. And you see everybody from the, the littlest of little to the older. And that may be the end of it. But I would just ask that if anybody feels like they um, would like to give to our mission, that, again, every penny of this goes to support... I can get emotional just talking about it. I always tell people that there's so much here in our own communities that we can support. And this has been a lifelong dream of mine. And I um, felt led to do this. I 
know that God has um, given me the pleasure to partner with the Sawyers in Kenya and the work that we are doing there, I could, I could talk about it for hours, but we are in the process of actually orchestrating a health clinic to be built and what the change this is making in these people's lives is, um, it's unspeakable because they are, they are actually learning to trust modern medicine. It's, it's saving children's lives. It's changing infant mortality rates. Like I said, I could talk about it for hours, but if, if anybody should feel led to give to this mission, we are, um, we are in obvious need, and we are also planning another trip in November. So um, I just wanted to share with you because it's, it's a passion, and I want our church to be involved. I want you to know what's going on, and if anybody ever has any questions, um, feel free to come and talk to me. But thank you for giving me the opportunity. How's everyone doing this week? It's been a beautiful week, hasn't it? Sun came out, warmed up a couple days for us. Grass is turning green. So this morning, um, as we were picking out these songs and stuff, a lot of them are around what Jesus did for us. And I thought it was a perfect timing to go ahead and start remembering what Christ did for us because it was such a beautiful thing. Like, it's getting to the point where the flowers are going to start blooming and the beauty of the earth is getting ready to unleash out of a dormant state. And as I think about that, I think about what more beautiful thing was there than the price that God paid for us that we could be in a relationship with him. And so downstairs in youth, we've been talking about pricelessness and what it means to be priceless and how each one of us is created priceless because of what God did for us. And so all this beauty revolves around one thing and all of our different passions revolve around one thing, and that is God. And so if you will, join with us in seeing Death Was Arrested this morning.
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. And darkness rejoices over heaven.
Liturgy literally means, if you, if you break it down, it means the work of the people. And I was just thinking about that this morning as we were singing. Because this church understands that, I think. This isn't just about watching what these guys are doing up here. It's not just about listening. Coming to hear something. It's about all the people coming together and doing the work of worshiping God together. And I just heard every voice and was just reminded of studies I've read that say you can tell the health of a church by how loud its people sing. And I just want to encourage you this morning. Keep singing loud. Keep living loud for the glory of God. It is the work of the people. It is not the work of me. It is not the work of these guys. It is the work of all of us. Father, thank you that you have included all of us. Thank you that you have, that everyone was included when Christ came. That anyone who would put their faith in Jesus, anyone who would turn from their sin and trust what Jesus had done could be included in your kingdom, could be included in your work, could be included in your family. And Lord, we just want to lift up our hearts. We just want to lift them up in one accord this morning and just say, we just want to give you praise and give you worship and give you glory. All the things that we've done, all the hurtful words that we've said, all of the thoughts that we've had that should have written us out of your story a long time ago. <laughs> By the blood of Jesus, we are included. We can enter in. We can do this work together. Because the price has been paid. And so, Father, we just want to sing this last part of this song out loud from the depths of who we are. The price has been paid in full by the blood that Jesus spilled. So let's, church, let's sing that loud. Let's lift our voices. Let's lift our hands. And let's celebrate the price that's been paid for us. It's been paid in full. We owe nothing. Yeah,
The reading this morning is from Genesis 10, verses 1 through 14. If I get the names wrong, forgive me. (laughs) These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Getim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, Sabteka. The sons of Rama, Shiva, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh. (laughs) Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Resen between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaftorim. So, uh, this is working, right? Really? It was working just a minute. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, so there's a lot of names in there, isn't there? And that was, uh, thank you, Thomas, that was quite a trial. And, and even the microphone, I mean, like, that was just, that was like 40 days in the wilderness, wasn't it? <laughs> but you were up to the challenge. Um, one of the things you might notice is, uh, you probably noticed a few familiar names in that passage. You know, there's a lot of names that we've never heard before. And when we get to passages like this, we kind of joke about, you know, the names. I, I, like in my small group, sometimes we'll be, we'll, 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 you know, we'll be asking who, who wants to read scripture and somebody will begin to volunteer and say, wait, there's no names in there, right? You know, just to make sure. Because we don't, a lot of these names are unfamiliar. They're names that we've never heard of. They're names that we like have no idea how some of these words even became names like Sabta and uh, um, Rehobo- Rehoboath Ur. Like, how would you like to be named Rehoboath Ur? You know? But uh, of course, I imagine they're probably like Jason. What a strange name. Who would, who would want to name a child Jason? You know? <clears throat> but um, one of the things that you'll notice is there are some familiar names in here. Like, for example, in verse 6, you have Egypt. And what we see is that Egypt, according to the scripture here, Egypt was a person before Egypt had a family and became a family, and eventually Egypt became a nation. And yes, we do need to let the children go. (laughs) I'm just excited. Yeah, let's release our children. Father, thank you for our children. Bless them. Bless the efforts of their leaders. And just help them to grow to become disciples of you, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So Egypt was a person, and then he became a family, and then he became an entire nation, just like we're going to see about Jacob later in the book of Genesis, or as we know him better by his name, Israel. Israel was a person, and then he becomes a family, and then he becomes an entire nation. And there's more. We see the Amorites in this passage. We see uh, Babel, uh, which would become Babylon. We see Nineveh, which would become this great city. And even mentioned that it's a great city. This is the great city that Jonah was sent to, remember, to to preach in Nineveh. It was the capital of Assyria, which was one of the biggest empires in the ancient world in the like 700 to 800 BC range. You have Canaan, which would become the Canaanites. The Canaanites were the people who lived in the land before God drove them out and gave the land to Israel. Uh, You have the Amorites. 
You have Tarshish, that's where Jonah ran off to. Instead of going to Nineveh, he went to Tarshish. You have Sheba, you might remember the Queen of Sheba. Sheba was probably down in Africa, maybe Ethiopia, that area. The Queen of Sheba comes up to, uh, to, uh, to visit Solomon in his day. And so you have all of these different names. All of these are going to make appearances later on in the Old Testament as nations, or at least as, as cities. And I, and I would imagine if an Old Testament scholar were to study this out, I would imagine just about all of these names in this list have tremendous historical significance. And so that's interesting. It's interesting to note you know, one of the things that we, we can notice about that, it's interesting to note that all the wars that we're fighting today, all of these, all of these, this, this genocide and these atrocities that are being committed, they started off as family squabbles, right? They started off as brothers who couldn't get along or, or cousins who, who did something and then forgiveness, unforgiveness got in there and just, just, uh, and just worked the way that unforgiveness works. And ultimately, many of these wars and these battles and these atrocities that are happening today, acts of terrorism, all these terrible things that are going on in the world, they ultimately started out as family squabbles. And that can tell us a, a thing or two about anger and unforgiveness. You know, anger and unforgiveness, if we don't deal with it, if we don't, if we don't handle it, if we don't cut it off, it gets festers, it gets bigger. And that's, that's the way it is with, with any sin. It gets bigger than we imagined it might get. It takes up more space in our lives than we ever wanted to give it, right? Sin, I've said this before, sin is never content to coexist, it always comes to conquer. Sin is never content to have that little space in your life that you want to give it. It always wants more space. It always wants to take over. Satan knows where he's going to end up and he knows where God's people are going to end up and he is not, he is not happy about it. And if possible, he'd like to take as many of us as he, as he can with him. Right? And I believe that we are secure in the power of the Holy Spirit. Those of us who are genuine believers are secure in the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's not going to stop him from doing everything he can to make everything as difficult on us as possible and to rob from us everything he can rob from us, even if he could rob from us the very eternal life that God has given to us. Satan is never content to coexist. Sin is never content to coexist. It always comes to conquer. So we can't let it have any place in our lives. And so this is interesting. You know, reading these names, seeing how these, these people are going to end up, seeing where these, these names are going to come back as, as people groups later on in the Old Testament. It's kind of interesting for, for a nerd like me, you know. But, but, uh, but what does this have to do with our lives today? And we're going to get there. I think there's application. All, all of Scripture is, is filled with truth that's applicable to our lives. But before we get there, I think we want to take one, one look quickly at, at one purpose of Scripture, and that is to preserve what happened. This is a record of God's dealings with humanity, and this stuff is important. And on some level, it's important just because it happened. Right? Why, why do we have this list of names? We, we've wondered this before. You know, why do we have all these genealogies? Why do we have this list of name, names? How is it applicable? Well, one of the ways it's applicable is because it happened. It happened. This is, what, this is part of what God has done in the world, that what God is doing in the world. We are a product of what has happened to us. We as humanity are a product of where we came from, and that's what the book of Genesis is all about. It's the, it's the book of beginnings, the beginnings of where the human race came from, the beginnings of where God's people came from, and the beginnings of how God's work in humanity and God's dealings with humanity started. And so it's important because we are, as, as a human race. We are a product of the things that have happened to us and where we've come from as, pe as people. We are a product of, of what we've done and the experiences that we've had. Right? And even sometimes those negative experiences. You think about that negative experience, that thing you'd like to forget, the thing that you did a long time ago that you still regret. Those places that you've been, those people that you've hurt, that you would go back and change if you could. On some level, if that didn't happen, you would not be the same person you are today. Now, that doesn't make those things good or okay. It just means that you are a product of what, what has happened to you. Anna and I were talking last night about, uh, about uh, something that I did in college, right? 
and uh, not one of my better moments. There's not a lot of things I really truly regret and wish I could go back and change in my life. There are a few. And I'm not saying I've not done some things wrong. There are a lot of, you know, I've, I've, I've done the wrong thing a lot of times. I've done things the wrong way a lot of times. And there's only a few moments that I really truly regret. And this was one of those. I hurt somebody very badly, one of the kindest, gentlest people I've ever met. And uh, I would, you know, we we're talking about, yeah, I, I wish I could go back and change that. Right? But on another level, I am who I am. And she is who she is because of the things that happened to us and the things that we did. And so that's one of the reasons this is important. And we can't ever, you know, a lot of times we approach Scripture, we kind of want to gloss it over and say, okay, how does it apply to my life? And, and we always, when we read Scripture, we need to apply it to our lives. Like, we, we should never really read Scripture without trying to understand what is God's Word to us, right? But on some level, we, 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 like, we skip over. On some level, this is important because it happened, right? And sometimes we have to be content with allowing some passages to be in there, because they need to be in there to preserve what happened, to preserve what people did, and to preserve what God did. Now, we're going to go on to make some important applications this morning because it's definitely there. But don't just discount the first meaning of this scripture. Why is it there? Because it happened. It shows us a little bit about who we are. It gives us a little sense of our history and our heritage as God's people. Okay? So what can we learn from this today? How can we make application from this passage to us today? Well, I think there are a few important things that we can see in this scripture. One is how it starts off in verse 1. Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generation, the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So there's that phrase again. These are the generations. Or, or in Hebrew, the Toledoth. You know, this is the, the birth record, the account of, the story of Noah and his sons. And we talked about, we've talked about this has come up, I think this is the fourth time this has come up. But we talked about this is a kind of a, always a turning point in the story. This is kind of the next chapter in the story. And we saw it with the story of, of Adam and with, with creation. We saw it with the story of Adam and his son Seth. We dealt with this pre-flood world. You know, the sons of God, the sons of men, the humanity breaking down into two camps, the godly lineage of Seth, the ungodly lineage of Cain. We saw humanity become so infiltrated with evil that judgment in the form of the flood was the only option. We saw the story of Noah. We saw how even in a terrible act of judgment, God's mercy is still evident. That God did not did not bring the flood because he was angry or, or just because he was angry, just because he wanted to, wanted to cause pain, but he brought this, this flood so he could rid the world of this wickedness and start over with Noah. And we saw how God always has a plan to start over again. And you realize that hasn't changed, right? God always has a plan to start over again. No matter where you are or what you've done, no matter how old you are, how many bridges you've burned, God always has a plan to start over again. And you might not see it, but it's there. God always has a plan to start over again. And so now as we move into the fourth section of the book of Genesis, this is the story of Noah and his sons. And as we get into this, we see the second purpose behind uh, this story. And the second thing that we see, we see, number two, we see humanity breaking down into two camps. Those who follow God and those who resist God. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might be saying, haven't we already done this? I mean, we did this with Cain and Seth, you know, Seth's godly lineage, Cain's ungodly lineage. You know, we, we already looked at this, right? Yes. So why are we doing it again? I don't know exactly you, know, you need to ask God because he's the one that put it in there again, right? No, no, I, I, I do. Actually, I do know why we're doing it again because it happened again, right? Humanity broke down into two camps, right? You have the godly lineage of Seth. You have the ungodly lineage of Cain. Wickedness gets more and more. Sin gets more and more on the earth. God says, I'm going to start over. He brings the flood. He starts over with Noah. Noah sins and humanity breaks down into two camps again. Shem and his, his, his descendants begin to follow God. Ham and Jacob, Japheth and his descendants begin to resist God and humanity is breaking down into two camps again. Those who follow God, God and those who resist God. Right? Because it's happening again. 
And it continues. We're going to see this all throughout Genesis. You, you would see it all throughout the Old Testament. And we still see it today. We're going to see it with Abraham and Lot. With Isaac, who is, who is the son of promise. And Ishmael, who is not. With, with Jacob and Esau, with Joseph and his brothers, with Moses who, who follows God and Pharaoh who resists God, with Joshua and the city of Jericho, Joshua who who's follows God, who who's God leads him into the land and the city of Jericho who resists him. And you have Rahab who defects from the enemies of God and is grafted into God's people. Hang on to that. We'll get back to that in a minute. You see it in Israel and Judah. You see that David and Saul, and we can go on and on. Jesus addresses it. He doesn't call it the sons of God and the sons of men like Moses does in Genesis. He calls it the wide road and the narrow road. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And that's still the case. There's one more thing. And we'll look at this in a little bit more detail next week when we get into the Tower of Babel. But as this structure continues, what we see is that God is narrowing down humanity and he is focusing his work on the people of God. He's focusing his work on certain people. So you have Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? In verse 5, that's the last we'll ever hear of Japheth's family. I mean, we'll run into some of these nations again as enemies of God's people. But we never see God working through these people again. We only see God working in spite of them. And with Ham, verse 14 is the last time that we're going to see Ham. The focus of God's activity moves on to the sons of Shem, to the Shemites, or you might say today to the Semites, to, to Israel, to God's people. And we move on down the line in chapter 11. Each generation, God focusing on one person until we get down to Abraham. And then in chapter 12, God calls out Abraham and he says, I'm going to finally, I'm going to make this right. I'm going to make it right through you and your family. But unlike Noah, I'm not going to get you to help make it right because you're just going to mess it up. Noah messed it up and you're going to do it too. I know it. You're going to do it too. And he was right. You know, we're going to see that when we get into Genesis chapter 12. God, God, makes, the, uh, God makes this incredible promise to Abraham. Abraham receives the promise, follows God by faith, ends up giving up his land, going down to Egypt, lying about his wife and, and, and getting into all kinds of trouble in Egypt, getting kicked out of Egypt. But this time, this time it's not going to destroy what God has done because God is not taking into account Abraham's righteousness. He's not building this promise on Abraham like he built the promise on Noah. He's building the promise on his own faithfulness. He's saying, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it with your cooperation. I'm not going to do it in, with your help. But I'm going to do it in spite of your foolishness and your disobedience. I'm going to save everyone. I'm going to save even the people that I've written out, even the people who have written themselves out of my story by the things that they've done. I'm going to bless every single nation through you, every last one. And yeah, right now I'm narrowing them down. Right now I'm weeding them out because I've got to focus my activity on one group and really we're going to get to the point where we, where we see the activity of God is focused on one man, Jesus and through Jesus, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every person that has been written out of God's story has an opportunity to be written back in. And we're going to look at this some more next week too because that's what the Tower of Babel, if this passage here suggests this to us, the Tower of Babel is going to just scream it at us that everybody who's been written out of God's story has an opportunity through Jesus to be written back in. And that's our takeaway from, that this, from this this morning. Although as a group, these people are weeded out here in this story. And they're, they're written out of God's story. Hope is not gone. And I wonder if there's some people in here this morning that feel like that. I wonder if you feel like maybe you've gone too far. We already saw how the people in Noah's day went too far. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like... You've gone too far. 
But in Noah's day, God still had a plan to start over. And God hasn't changed. They weren't, humanity was not too far gone. And you are not too far gone either. The arm of the Lord, as it says in the Old Testament, the arm of the Lord was not too short to save. And the arm of the Lord hasn't shrunk since then. It's still not too short to save today. And that's a theme that is woven throughout the Bible. You really think you're too far gone. You're not. You think you've made such a mess of your life that God can't fix it. You haven't. But Jason, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the people that I've hurt. No, I don't. And I would imagine in a group this size, there are probably a couple of people in here that have some shocking secrets in their life that I have no idea about, that nobody in this room has any idea about. I don't know what you've done. But I don't need to know what you've done because I know who my God is and I know that my God, that his arm is not too short that it cannot save. I don't know what you've done, but I know it wasn't as bad as the people in Noah's day. And God still had a plan to start over then as bad as it was. And God still has a plan to start over today. Yeah, but you don't really know how old I am. I'm, I'm old and I'm set in my ways. And I don't know. Do you really think I can change? Noah was 500 years old. Anybody in here 500 years old? Nobody? All right. We're good on that then. God hasn't changed. You are not forgotten this morning. Some of you may feel like God wrote you out of his story a long time ago, but he didn't. And I want to give you one example. And we can probably pull an example out of every single one of these nations that's here in Genesis chapter 10. It'll take a while, so we're not going to do that. But I'm going to give you one example that just jumps out at me. Canaan. The worst of the worst, right? He was cursed last week in Genesis chapter 9. Canaan was cursed. We said he was selfish. We said he was a pervert. We said that his, his followers followed in his footsteps. We know the Canaanites, they were the people that inhabited the land before the Israelites got there. God drove them out because they were the worst of the worst. They worshiped sex. They worshiped through sex. Their worship practice for worshiping their gods was to go to the temple and have sex with temple prostitutes. Like it doesn't get a lot worse than that, right? Okay. So Canaan is the worst of the worst. And we fast forward to Joshua chapter two. This is a few hundred years uh, later. And Joshua chapter 2 says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Chittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. Her people were the worst of the worst. Like all these people here in Genesis chapter 10, almost all these people become enemies of God's people as we go throughout the Old Testament. And some of these people commit great atrocities against God's people as we go throughout the Old Testament. But Canaan, they're the worst. They're the ones that God drove out of the land because they were so wicked. God drove them out and gave the land to his people. And they're the worst of the worst. And here's the thing. They go to the house of Rahab, who is a prostitute in Jericho, right? And she was probably a temple prostitute. So she was probably one of those women that worked in the temple that men would come to, to worship with her. It doesn't get a lot worse than that. She is the worst of the worst group of people. And some of us know the story. She hears the, about the people that are coming. She hears about the Israelites. She hears about their God and what their God has done to, to the people that have fought against them out in the desert. And she knows that her people you know, Jericho's a strong city. They've got a strong army, but she knows they might be able to take out the Israelites, but they are no match for the Israelites' God. And she knows it, and she knows all the people in Jericho know this. I mean, she told the spies at one point, she said that, that all the men of Jericho, their hearts are melting with fear before your God. Right? But they just, they, didn't, they refused to give in to it. They said, we're going to fight, we're going to... We're just going to, we refuse to give up. But Rahab, she understood what was coming. She knew what was coming. She knew that God's people were coming. She knew that God was going to fight for them. She knew that her city was going down. And so these spies come to her house and she says, I'll tell you what, I will hide you and I will help you and I'll do whatever you need me to do. 
If you'll just remember me and let me and my family live when you take Jericho down to the ground. Because honestly, I don't really want Jericho anymore. I'm sick of my life. I'm sick of the city. I'm sick of the idol worship. I'm sick of the things that I have to do every day. I'm sick of crying myself to sleep at night. I don't want Jericho anymore. I don't want this anymore. Your people can have it. They can burn it to the ground. They can burn my house to the ground. They can just spare me. Let me join you. And so they agree. And as far as we know, she is accepted into God's people. And that in itself would be quite a story. That in itself would be something amazing. Until we get to Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. This is the, the genealogy of Jesus. It says, And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. I recognize that name. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. Ruth's another person that had been, she was a Moabite. She was written out of God's story too. Rahab. Her people had been written out of God's story, but by faith, she's written back in. And not just that, she's written back in to the lineage of Jesus himself. She is a part of that family, that lineage that God is going to use to bless the whole world. That family includes Rahab, the temple prostitute, the worshiper of Baal, the worst of the worst. So don't think you're too far gone because we serve a God who always, who always has a plan to redeem. And he's not changed. The same God that rescued Rahab from her life, from herself, from her dying city, that's the same God that we've come here to worship this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you always have a plan to start over. Thank you for being the God of Rahab. The God of the temple prostitute from one of the most wicked cities in one of the most wicked countries that's ever lived. And for seeing her, and for seeing her faith,
And if we can have a couple of people come up and take our offering, we're just, let's just keep singing and keep... Uh, and if you've got any prayer requests, we're going to pray at the end of the service, so please share those with us. we enter into this just time of prayer I know that this is something that we have been doing since the beginning of the year it is an opportunity to um, just mimic even the early church as it talks about in Acts 242 where um, they devoted themselves to the Apostles preaching and the fellowship and as well as to the breaking of bread and to prayer so as we've done um, just now with the breaking of bread um, this is just an invitation to prayer as well. Um, and so the mic is open. Um, I will just go ahead and, and open us up um, in that invitation. And then um, the mic is open for anyone to feel free to, whether it's a prayer of adoration, confession, 
thanksgiving or just um, that need, that supplication and help. Um, but I'll just go ahead and open us up in a word. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that your throne is available to all um, whom you have called according to your purpose. And so, um, Father, we just, uh, we thank you for your truth this morning. Um, we praise you that, uh, um, that we are, that, that nothing is beyond redemption. Um, that you, uh, that nothing is too far gone. And, uh, and Father, I just um, pray that um, if there is anyone um, here today, that that, that, would, that that lie would just be um, completely abolished. Um, and Father, we just thank you for the songs here at the end. Um, the reason why nothing is too far gone is because um, you finished it um, on the cross. Um, through your blood, um, there can be that redemption. Um, and through the surrender, through, through us waving that, that white flag, we can come into communion. We can come into community with you. And so, Father, um, as we do that now, I just pray that you would bless this time um, as, uh, as we lift up our voices with one mind and with one heart before you. Um, so, Father, uh, we thank you and praise you and um, just pray that you would be glorified. Hey guys, we had uh, kind of a prayer request. Wanted to uh, pray for you know what happened in Florida, uh, the shooting of the kids. Uh, it's kind of emotional. I got three three kids, and you know that that's that's horrible what happened. Um, you know, that's just uh, to me a reflection of where our society is right now. Uh, so I want to pray for you know everybody that's involved with that and everything. So, uh, dear Lord. Uh, Thank you for everything you've done. Um, like I was talking about, you know, our society now uh, seems lost. Uh, but all we need is you. You've given us, uh, you've given us an example in your Son Jesus Christ of how to live on this earth. Uh, no, we're not all going to be perfect like He is. But you know, you gave us a, a perfect example. You've given us the blueprint, uh, the Bible. Uh, so, you know, uh, just uh, uh, we need to use that and encourage that. But most of all, I want to I want to pray for the people that were involved with that, uh, the parents, the students, um, just come down and, and help them out uh, through this 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 horrible time. I even want to pray for the young man that did the shooting. Lord, uh, uh, please come in and, uh, you know, touch him and, 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 and let him know what he did and, you know, that, that even he is not, you know, past your love. Um, you know, things in the world like this happen, and, you know, it's, it's very hard to comprehend. Uh, so, uh, but like I said, Lord, it, it, you know, you, you've given us everything we need. It's just, uh, you know, we, we need to accept it and open our hearts to that. And, you know, as us as churches, we need to open our church up to everybody. You know, this is about love. This is about, you know, uh, everyone and, and accepting everyone. We, we all sin. We all do bad things. But uh, nothing is uh, past, you know, your grace and, and the gift that your son Jesus Christ gave to us on the cross when he died on the cross for our sins. Because we are sinners, Lord. So, um, I, I just like I said, I just want to pray for uh, everybody that's involved in, in what happened this week in, uh, in Florida. Amen. Father, I just want to lift up your church to you, Lord. Uh, your church here, help us to, uh, to draw close to you. Help us to know you. Help us to, uh, to just take your word into our hearts and our minds and to, to let it inform every area of our life. Help us to become disciples. Help us to become disciples who are leading those around us to become disciples. We pray for our community around us. We pray for our neighborhood. Pray for Mr. Hollifield who lives right across the parking lot. Him and his wife are unable to leave the house due to health conditions. I pray for my neighbor who lost his wife of 40 or 50 years. I don't remember exactly. Just last winter, Lord, I pray for... Um, for us to be the hands and feet of Christ to those around us. 
And Lord, we pray not just for this church, we pray for the pray for your church, Lord. We pray for Grace Church and Wellspring up in Michigan, Lord. We pray for Pastor Paul up there. We pray for Tyler and for Exodus Church in, in Charlotte. We pray for Pastor Ryan and for uh, First Assembly in Burlington. Lord, we lift up uh, the church in Kenya and, and, and Travis and Laura and the missionaries over there and the work that you're doing there. Lord, we lift up the, the church in, uh, in Istanbul where Tim and Missy Bentley spent years. And Lord, we just pray that you would do a work there. Lord, we lift up uh, Ronnie Wyatt and, and the neighborhood church up in Syracuse. Uh, we lift up Redeemer Church who's doing a, a fantastic work up there in a, in a dark part of the world. And Lord, we, just, uh, we just pray for them. Pray that you would give them uh, fruit for the work and Lord, we pray for our, the church and our community. We pray for unity. We pray for purpose. Lord, we pray for Summit and for, for Crosslink that's right down the road and for Thrive. And Lord, for my friends over at Walker Road and, and uh, for all the different churches that there's no way we could possibly mention in this short time. Lord, we just lift the church up to you. Lord, wake us up, unify us, and use us for your purposes in the world. In Jesus' name. God, we pray this morning, especially for Mavis and Roy Leonard, as um, their health just doesn't allow them to get out very much. We just pray that this week in particular, you'll um, just that they'll really feel your presence with them, that you'll open up the eyes of the people around them to um, opportunities to serve them, and just really love on them as they um, aren't able to get out and interact as much as maybe they would like to do. Lord, I want to take a moment to pray uh, for those in our congregation who struggle with um, depression and mental illness. Lord God, you are the glory and the lift of our heads, Lord Jesus. You are the God who hears us, Lord God. You know us, Lord Jesus, through and through. I just pray for those today that are discouraged. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will bring comfort, Lord God, and those who are struggling, Lord Jesus. Um, I thank you, Lord God, that there is a purpose in our suffering, Lord God. And Lord, you won't give us more that we can bear um, through your Holy Spirit. God, I do just pray uh, for those who, who aren't even here today, Lord God, because they're, they're struggling so much. I just ask, God, you'll send um, your church, Lord Jesus, um, uh, to those individuals that they might be comforted and know, God, uh, how um, much you love them. I'd like to pray for Chris and Roxanne, um, who've recently moved to Michigan, and just want to pray that they find a good settlement, good friends, and a church family to, to pour into, and um, pray for James as, as he continues to be reared by his, um, his God-loving uh, parents. I also want to pray for Mike and Trish Hall, who are, who are right now serving with the two and three years old. Uh, Mike um, lost his sister recently, and I just want to pray. Uh, Father, give, uh, give him peace, give uh, Mike and Trish peace uh, that comes from you and that surpasses all understanding. Um, I, I don't know his sister um, or where she stood um, eternally with you, but I, I pray that, that she's with you right now and um, she's benefiting um, in your presence and in your glory. I'm going to close... Um, this prayer session and just ask that you also acknowledge all the prayers that were, were unspoken today um, because you are a God who cares um, for our needs and you care for for us um, on a, the smallest level and on the on the grandest level as well. I ask that you hear our prayers and you comfort us uh, in Jesus name. If everyone could uh, Gather hands across the aisle. Uh, Jason's going to close us.
in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have heard our prayer, that you have received our worship. Just uh, pray that, uh, that it doesn't end when we leave this room, but that our, our week is a week that is marked by prayer and worship and service to you and whatever it is that we end up doing during this week. And Lord, we just thank you for who you are and for what you've done. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Bridge 42 Church, you are sent.